Welcome, welcome to this special edition of The Prophetic Life with Larry Sparks, your host here for both the live and the podcast experience. So welcome, hope you're doing well. And I am actually really looking forward to this particular broadcast. I'm in the process right now of trying to navigate all the technical things, as always. But I am looking forward to sharing some things with you because over the last 48 hours, the Lord has really spoken to me. I believe there is a revelation from Scripture that we need to look at if, in fact, we as the church, as the ecclesia, are going to be effective and impactful in the days ahead. So if you're watching live, I encourage you to let me know. I would love to, uh, <laughs> I'd love to send you my greetings. Hello, David, nice to see you. And again, if you're listening to the podcast, I encourage you to join and watch the Facebook. But hello, everybody. Trying to get it on all the different uh, places. I just really believe in order for us to move forward right now in the body of Christ, we cannot afford to be divided. Divided, we stand. What did Jesus say? House divided cannot stand. Context, he was talking about the demonic kingdom. But I believe that that is true for any kingdom. Any kingdom that's divided cannot and will not stand. So the reality is this. We need to figure out how to proceed as a united body of Christ, body of Messiah. But here's the deal. Okay, I'm going to make this point and then I'm going to dive right on in. Um, there is an unhealthy, and I would borderline say a demonic, ecumenicalism. Okay, ecumenicalism. What are we going to say? Uh, ecumenical means multiple churches, denominations coming together. The ungodly demonic version of that would be us actually compromising on the key orthodox tenets of the faith as outlined in Scripture as given language in the Council of Nicaea and in the Apostles' Creed, that is, I believe, a demonic ecumenicalism. When we decide, oh yeah, we love everybody, we love everybody, 100%. We love everybody, we wanna bless everybody, but at the same time, we cannot compromise on the essentials. What are the essentials? The virgin birth. What are the essentials? The exclusivity of Jesus. There is only one name. There is one name under heaven by which man can be saved. It's Jesus. These things are should be no-brainer things to us. It should be like, well, Larry, why do you even why are you even talking about this stuff? But we are living right now in the 21st century where some of these things that are cardinal tenets of the faith are up for grabs. Where if we don't like certain things in the Bible, we reconstruct them. Again, just taking a couple minutes as everybody's coming on. What does that mean? We reconstruct. That's one of the things that the Lord revealed to me. One of the 10 things that the devil is using to try to turn the church, try to turn Christianity upside down, is this ridiculous, nonsensical, downright demonic idea of reconstructing the faith. Listen, there is a healthy reconstruction where I reconstruct my life to agree with something, to agree with the word of God. That is healthy. It is healthy if there is religious tradition or denominationalism or ways of thinking or paradigms or perspectives that identify in my life that are contrary or contradictory to the word, and I reconstruct those things to agree with the word. Okay, that's a healthy reconstruction process. There is a demonic reconstruction process, sadly, that is being explored and touted by many millennials and next generation people, where if something is culturally acceptable, then we want to rewrite the Bible to accommodate it. If there are things that are being redefined, if there are things that are clearly defined in the Bible as sin, but it's like, hey, you know, we want to be tolerant, we want to be loving, we want to be progressive, we, we, we want to get with the times. Let's change the ancient boundary lines. Let's reconstruct the scripture to accommodate godlessness, which your culture says it's okay. 
Culture right now is very much under the influence of darkness. Okay, I got to rein it in because I want to actually get into the conversation here. But culture is by and large, not entirely, because I actually believe the leaven of the kingdom of God is expanding and advancing. But culture, by and large, as we see day after day, as we scroll through news feeds, is under the influence of darkness. And the reality is this. Culture needs to be reconstructed by the word of God as opposed to the word of God being reconstructed by culture. Does that make sense? Anyway, onward we go. I want to dive into the conversation. Just got back from California. I was out. I don't even know where it is. I can't even pronounce the name of it. I think it's maybe in the Irvine, Laguna Beach area. I put up some pictures on Facebook. It's a beautiful area. It's quite stunning. Never have actually seen the Pacific Ocean. Believe it or not, I've seen the San Diego Bay. I've gone around a little boat in the San Diego Bay. But I've actually never seen with my own eyes the beaches, the fine beaches of the Pacific Coast, which was lovely. So I did that, and I had the honor and the privilege of being invited to a youth night that Benny Hinn Ministries was hosting at his studio. And the gentleman who invited me is one of our Destiny Image authors, David Diga Hernandez, who I have the utmost respect for. He's an amazing guy. 30 years old, but God's raising him up. I mean, he's more mature than many people older than I am are. Uh, Just watching him move in the miraculous and keep the attention and focus exclusively on Jesus. I am so thrilled about what God is doing in his life, but he invited me to be just a part of this gathering, this youth event that Benny Hinn Ministries was hosting, where Benny would be the host and be on his program. Um, So that's all I knew. I really felt led of the Lord to go, had a bit of warfare actually getting there. But I do want to encourage you, there are times, hey, James Cernero is on, wonderful. There are times where there's warfare against your assignment. And, you know, the devil will try to make you not want to do something. For example, I just had all this warfare coming against me. I knew I was supposed to go. What a privilege and an honor to be invited to something like this. But I had all sorts of crazy stuff. We've had some crazy swirl going on in our house. And I was like, you know what, Lord, I just don't want to go. This is just too much. And the Lord said, no, you have to go. This is quite significant. Now I know totally why. So I ended up going, praise the Lord, uh, got there. And so... It was for an evening youth event, had uh, some wonderful guests. With, I'm still getting to learn and know some of them. Matt Cruz, I believe, was one of them. Matt Cruz, who's a wonderful, powerful young evangelist. You might have seen him on social media. I think Holy Spirit's really breathed on that. Powerful young evangelist. There was a gentleman, Prophet Rob. I forget his last name, but he is also, I think he's more um, Northern California in that area. So I'm sure as I get to know these folks more, either we'll have them on the show or I'll just be mentioning them a little bit more. And uh, and Pastor Vladimir, I don't know his last name. I know, but I've known about him for a long time. Vlad, they call him Pastor Vlad or Vladimir. He's up in the Pacific Northwest, I think in Washington state. And he has a ministry called Hungry Generation, if I'm correct. And God is moving powerfully through that ministry. I've got to totally have him on one of these days because he's, goodness, I think he's 30. He's got to be, I mean, he's a young guy. What maturity, what depth, and what hunger he has. It's absolutely contagious for seeing a generation counter the Holy Spirit. So all these people, I have just been amazed at, at just connecting with them and seeing this next generation that Pastor Benny is so supportive of. So Anyway, what is, I said I was going to name names, so I'm going to name a name, okay? Everybody, all the heresy hunters want us to name names and, you know, throw people under the bus. Well, here's the deal, okay? I am talking very specifically this evening about somebody, Pastor Benny Hinn. Now, I've been saved for 20 years. I, I mean, 20 years is really where I've given my life to God. Uh, I, I've known about Jesus most of my life. Uh, I went to evangelical school, although I always tell people while I was going there, I basically wanted Jesus enough so I didn't have to go to hell and I didn't miss the rapture. That is why I wanted Jesus, because, man, they got that into you in my in, in my school while I was growing up. But I really didn't desire God until 1999, where I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit 
and I am doing what I am doing today, and I am where I am because of that touch by the Holy Spirit. So all that to say, for about 20 years, I have been aware of this evangelist named Pastor Benny Hinn. I don't even remember. I don't have a distinctive memory of when I was first introduced to his ministry. Truth be told, as a 16-year-old believer, when I first got touched by the Holy Spirit, I remember consuming resources. And I know at that time, Good Morning Holy Spirit was one of those resources, which is, I believe, one of the greatest books ever written about somebody. It's really, yes, it's somewhat teaching, but it's definitely more autobiographical, but it's not autobiographical in the sense that you'd feel like Pastor Benny is just writing about himself. It is what I call an autobiographical invitation. I mean, I'm sure many of you who are listening have read Good Morning, Holy Spirit. I highly actually recommend it. Even if you have concerns or questions about Pastor Benny Hinn, which I hope tonight to answer to the best of my ability. And in fact, I actually believe right here in the Bible I have a word from the Lord right out of the mouth of Jesus that will hopefully bring any questions and concerns. And is he real? Is it this? Is it that? I, I am tired of that. I, you know, yes, yes, there are false prophets. Yes, there are false teachers, 100%. In fact, Pastor Jack Hibbs, just as a side note, Pastor Jack Hibbs, who's about 45 minutes away from where I was in California, just recently, the last two um, Sundays at his church, Calvary Chapel in Chino Hills, has done a message. I, I guess it's a series within a series about false prophets and false teachers. They are out there. He even audaciously showed some video clips of somebody in, quote unquote, the neo postmodern evangelical church who he would deem to be a false teacher and a false prophet. Okay. And again, that, that, that I believe he did that very appropriately. And I would actually agree with him on that observation. But here's the deal, and I'm not going to go into name and name. That, that's not where I'm going tonight. But the guy that Jack Hibbs was talking about, listen, a false prophet or a false teacher, please, please, please use the fear of the Lord before using that language. I'm not saying don't use that language. I'm not saying don't judge. Oh, we don't want to judge people. No, it says you shall judge them by their fruit. But I prophesy right now to you. It says judge them by their fruit. Don't judge them by their past. Okay. I know there's a lot of leaders who have had times of great difficulty throughout their ministry. I know they regret them. I know they look back with sadness and sorrow on those times. But here's the reality, okay? They are not who they used to be. They've advanced. They are in process. Praise God that God does not judge you or I on our past, okay? Here's the problem with somebody's past, okay? If we are advancing, if we're moving forward, if our eyes are on Jesus, if we forget that which is behind and press on towards that which is ahead, that's wonderful, okay? But I do know right now there's other just nonsense that's been going on in the body of Christ where there are people who have not only had a past of issues and problems and sin, but that past continues to go unchecked into the present and there is no genuine, legitimate repentance. Again, other people are dealing with that in the body of Christ right now. That's not my assignment because I'm not part of that. I'm not in that sphere. I'm not in that arena of jurisdiction. But that's when the past is a problem. Okay, if you have progressed, this is a word of the Lord for somebody. If you have progressed, if you're on a journey, listen, don't let the devil hold your past against you if you are moving forward with Jesus. Okay, the past is under the blood. The past is under the blood, and here's the deal, and I'm going to dive on in after this, but if we continue to use people's past against them, oh, that person's a false teacher, a false prophet, because back in 1989, he said this, or back in 1992, well, has he repented for that? Has he confessed that? Has he repudiated that remark? If he has, guess what you're doing? You're acting like the devil. Can I say that? I just did. If we are bringing people's past, please hear my heart on this. If we are bringing people's past, whether it's a minister or somebody like Donald Trump, we're bringing their past against them today. And if they seem to be, again, there's only so much we can judge because only God knows the heart. But if they seem to be on a road to advancement, particularly a Christian minister, if they seem to be moving forward, if they seem to say, you know what? I don't believe what I used to believe. That was wrong then please don't act like the devil. Please don't try to bring their past out against them. Because can I, I'll point my finger at myself. 
I have stuff in my past that I'm not proud of, and chances are you do too. <laughs> you know what? I'm sure at the end of the day, there's things that we're not proud of from yesterday. But we are on a journey with God, and we are advancing forward, forgetting that which is behind and pressing onwards that which lies ahead. Had to say that because I do believe that is a word of the Lord. We do not want to act like the devil and bring stuff that is under the blood of Jesus against somebody in the present if that person has repented for those past issues. Okay. All that to say, five hours with Benny Hinn. What was it like? I'll tell you in one short statement. Because, yes, I was on this program with him, and we were ministering, and he was praying, and I was amazed, and I was in awe of how he so stepped back and pushed the next generation ahead. I was shocked. I didn't quite know how to navigate it, because Pastor Benny, I believe, has such a wonderful way. I mean, I've gone to his fire conferences. I don't know if I've ever gone to one of his miracle crusades. I might have. I think I, I, think I have. But I've gone to many events where he's ministered and talk about somebody who knows how to navigate the move and partner with the Holy Spirit. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, But it was one of those things where while I was on this program with all these next generation powerful preachers, my goodness, I loved, I I loved, I, I, I was shocked at how Pastor Benny stepped back and he gave the next generation the ability to step forward. That, to me, was so beautiful. It was very pure. It was absolutely very pure. It was funny. He gave me the opportunity to speak, which I considered quite an honor. And uh, it was funny because the Lord's been talking to me about a whole bunch of stuff, particularly Prophet Elijah. I don't have time to go into all this right now, but Prophet Elijah and the prophet's job to speak right now onto the center stage, the main stage of cultural conversation. Okay. Elijah did two things. He showed up and he spoke up. He didn't just decree and declare in his prayer closet. Hello. I, I'm all about decreeing and declaring, but we were not meant to just decree and declare in a prayer closet, nor were we meant just to have prophetic conferences and supernatural events that are kind of like a sideline subculture conversation where we're having our charismatic phenomenon while the real conversation is being played out in places like CNN and the New York Times. We need to be right in the middle of the center stage of the cultural conversation, contributing prophetic wisdom, insight, and the word of the Lord. Okay, Martin Luther King actually, he described the church as the conscience of the state, and he warned what would happen if the church lost its prophetic zeal, prophetic edge. So all of that to say, I was just so impressed at how God is using Pastor Benny. And at the end of the time where I was ministering, and I, I shared a little bit of these thoughts, I said, oh, you know, I, I just wanted, I wanted Pastor Benny to pray for me. I wanted him to pray and impart the fire of God. Pastor Benny, pray for me. Pray for this next generation. And ultimately, you know, we, we all prayed for a variety of different things, and it was wonderful. But um, that was fun. That was great. I enjoyed so much just even sitting under these different ministries and receiving from them. But what I wanted to share about, and I can only share what I feel the Holy Spirit giving me clearance to share, because for several hours after the show, Jim or James, who's watching right now, you're, I'm sure, very familiar with these kinds of things. I guess Pastor Benny enjoys staying up late. And I was up a considerable time that day. So my flesh was weak, but my spirit was willing. We were all back in the green room. Pastor Benny just sat there and he, and he shut the door and he encouraged all the young people just to come on in. And you know what? It wasn't even Pastor Benny saying, okay, now I'm going to sit here because I'm your spiritual authority or your superior or a father, and I'm going to teach you guys, and I'm going to raise you young whippersnappers up. Oh, my goodness, no. But it, you know what? He's not trying to be a father, but he is a father in the faith. And there is just this real pure, I believe, Holy Spirit magnetism for all the young people in that room. And I actually believe the the you know however many years left Benny Hinn has on the earth, one of the great things I see God doing through that man is imparting to the next generation. Because the one thing I could say about him in the hours after, after we stepped off stage and we went behind 
you know, into the green room with just Pastor Benny Hinn, I sat there and listened to a friend of God. That's what I would say about Pastor Benny. He is a friend of God. Friend of God. Just uh, how much he loves Jesus. And you know what? One of the greatest pieces of advice, because there's a Q&A time. My goodness, questions and answers with Pastor Benny. You can ask him a uh, five-word question. And he just unloads wisdom. And, you know, there's some people who just like to talk to hear themselves. This man is just a deep well. He's a deep well of wisdom and revelation. How? From what? His history with God. But one of the young evangelists asked him this question. Pastor Benny Hinn, what is the one thing? What do you think is the most important? Something like this. That the next generation needs to know. If you could impart one thing to the next generation, what would it be? And you know what he said? To preach the cross. There's no power without the cross. Preach the cross. Preach the consecrated, crucified life. I just want to pause right there because I know there's a lot of naysayers. And then the naysayers and the heresy hunters, they're against anybody and everybody who would be considered charismatic, Pentecostal, operating in the gifts of the Spirit, that type of thing. Um, there must be some kind of blinders on them. Listen, I know we disagree on certain things. Let's love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and the Messiah. We probably disagree over cessationism versus continuationism, which is do the gifts of the Spirit, the power gifts particularly, do they continue or did they cease with the canonization of Scripture or the death of the last apostle? Okay, that's to me a very important thing. But we can still love one another and advance if we have differences in opinions on those things. Okay, listen, other things. This is very important. This is communicated. When we go around throwing this language of heresy or false teacher, a false prophet, false teacher or false pro uh, false teacher or a false prophet, unless they turn to the Lord, that is a hell bound heretic. That is somebody who is not of the fold of God. So. They are somebody who deny the cardinal truths of Scripture. So I will tell you, heresy, oh boy, heresy is not believing in prosperity. Although, obviously, there are extremes associated with the whole prosperity stuff. And guess what? Pastor Benny has repudiated that. He has confronted it. He's repented of it. He's dealt with that. And I believe I've seen the fruit, and I'm continuing to wit witness that. So you will judge them not by their past. You'll judge them by their fruit. I even have listened to and watched how he does offerings. Now, as far as I can tell, he's not doing that. So praise the Lord. That's beautiful. But even so, we may differ on that. I differ on that. I staunchly repudiate, reject the carnal prosperity gospel. In fact, anybody that would dare use the phraseology of a prosperity gospel, that is erroneous. That is sickening. That is something I reject. But prosperity and the imbalances of prosperity, to me, that's not heresy unless, please hear me, unless it replaces or occupies an emphasis greater than Jesus, greater than Calvary, greater than his blood. Listen, Anything good, if anything even good, if anything even true, becomes elevated above the cross, above the blood of Jesus, above his virgin birth, his death, his resurrection, and the truth and the fact that, yes, he will split the sky and he will come again. Anything is exalted above Jesus. It is a high thing that must come down. That is the reality there. So I just want to encourage you. It's a very important thing for us to discern and recognize what is heresy, what is not. Because that's one of the things that I know people accuse everybody of. Um, but you know what? In those hours that I got to spend with this man, just sitting and listening, I didn't really want to contribute to the conversation. I wanted to receive from the conversation. And my goodness, it was incredibly rich. And just some of the things, you know, they asked him about praise and worship, contemporary praise and worship, which is very interesting. And uh, I would share some of his perspectives on this. Um, you know, often with contemporary praise and worship, you have this language of a worship leader. And they asked Pastor Benny, something like, I'm, I'm not quoting this verbatim. It's like, you know, what do you think about being a worship leader? Or how do you do that? How do you navigate that? He's like, I am not a worship leader. He's like, 
No one can lead you into worship. Now we can have different perspectives on that. That's fine. He's like, but the greatest worship, quote unquote, leaders are the ones who are worshiping God. The ones who are simply wanting to worship the Lord. And by doing so, they draw other people in to that worship. And I'm sure for any of you who have attended any of Pastor Benny's crusades or conferences, he's a worshiper. I love that. You'd know that that man is truly, sincerely, not only worshiping Jesus, but by doing so, he's bringing other people into it. He made a very interesting observation. Sometimes in praise and worship, I don't know if you feel this way, but I have felt this way. He's like, sometimes in, sometimes in praise and worship, by the time you're done singing a handful of songs, you feel tired. You feel like, oh man, it's almost like, okay, now I got to listen to a message. Because sometimes there's just so much of a press. There's so much push. There's so much, I'm going to do this for you, God. I'm going after it. And I just love the flow. Oh man, I miss just the flow of worship. That's what I love about going to Pastor Benny's events, where it's just this beautiful, seamless flow. And he's singing, you are great. And I sing praises to you. And you don't want me to sing, but I mean, it's just beautiful. It's just this organic flow where he is not, oh, Benny Hinn, the worship leader. He's Benny Hinn, the worshiper, and we are all worshiping God together. That's what I love about the days of Toronto and the vineyard movement and what God birthed in the 1990s. Listen, there's so much beautiful worship out today, and there's so many songs that I love, and there's so much new stuff that's amazing. I'm just saying we never want to think, well, I'm the, you know, even for those of you who are worship leaders, that was such great advice. You know what? The greatest thing as a worship leader that you can do is set the example by being the greatest worshiper. And it was just beautiful. And we see that consistently in his gatherings and his meetings. Um, and just, just listening to him share. Again, some things I don't even feel qualified nor appropriate to share about because he really shared his heart with us. He shared his experiences. I mean, he has known and walked with so many generals and mothers and fathers of the faith. And truly, he is he is such a general and he is such a mother. I said mother, but he's one of the mothers and fathers of the faith would be Benny and Suzanne Hinn. And, I, you know, I'm just grateful for the, just for the price he's paid. And for the place he has in the body of Christ, you know, I don't want to go too much longer, but I am going to conclude by reading the scriptures that the Lord put in my heart from John chapter 17. But in conclusion concerning Pastor Benny Hinn, because, you know, I, I, I am I am honored to put up a photo of me um, getting, you know, a photo with Pastor Benny. I am honored to get to know this man. I'm, I've been honored to know many amazing men and women throughout the body of Christ, from Dr. Jack Graham at Prestonwood Baptist Church, John and Carol Arnett up in Toronto, Bill Johnson in Redding, California, John Kilpatrick. Most of the people I've known have been more of the charismatic Pentecostal flavor, because that's just the world I've been in. But even leaders like Pastor Jack Graham, who was on the board at Adrian Rogers Ministry that I was a part of, or Pastor Tom and Todd Mullins of Christ Fellowship and Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, who are my pastors for 15 years. Um, so I'm, I, I just so value what God is doing through the whole body. There's people like John Piper, who I'm so deeply impacted by, drinking deeply from his writings, or Alistair Begg, listening to his amazing expository teaching and preaching. Same thing with Dr. Adrian Rogers, who is now obviously home with the Lord, or Jack Hibbs at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. Listen, Everybody in the body of Christ, yeah, we're different. As opposed to seeing differences as division. Oh, hear me on this, folks, please. Differences should not be divisions that separate us. Differences should be distinctives that cause us to celebrate one another's uniqueness. Can I say that again? David Diga Hernandez, nice to see you on there. Okay, please hear me one more time, then I want to read John chapter 17. Because again, at the end of the day, we all have uniquenesses and differences in the body of Christ. Listen, on my bookshelf, I have an amazing book called The Gospel According to God. I'm going to do this because I actually believe this shifts something in the spirit realm, okay, by John MacArthur. Now, immediately, many of my charismatic brothers and sisters are like, John MacArthur, we staunchly reject him. Because obviously, John MacArthur is one of the last and most vocal cessationists not believing in the continuation of the gifts of the Spirit. And he's actually very antagonistic towards the charismatic movement. But do you know what I say? 
I staunchly disagree with him there, but he is a brother in God. Furthermore, not just a brother, he is a father, not just a father, a wonderful expositor of the scriptures. Furthermore, he's written this amazing book, The Gospel According to God, which is based on Isaiah 53. I think one of the greatest expository messages all in one single book about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 53. I honor, I honor John MacArthur. I honor Todd Friel of Wretched Radio, who boldly goes on to co- college campuses preaching the gospel, anointed to be an apologist. Do I staunchly disagree with sometimes how he phrases things or communicates things, particularly when it comes to his thoughts about the, the alleged new apostolic reformation, which doesn't exist? Sorry. There's no secret code. I don't have my code ring yet in the new apostolic reformation. Just letting you know. Um, <laughs> But I staunchly disagree with him, but he's my brother. And if we could get on the same page, and when I say get on the same page, listen, I believe we should have healthy debate and discussion. Because that's another thing where, I'll I'll just be totally transparent. Recently, I was telling the Lord, because there's sometimes, I don't know if you ever go through this, but I do where you hear something or there's somebody out there preaching or writing or whatever, and you just continue, you you think to yourself, I thought to myself, I don't know if I agree with that. And I found myself saying that um, a lot about certain people or certain things. You know what the Lord told me? I I kept saying either in my mind mind or out loud, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I agree with that. And the Lord said, Larry, did it ever occur to you that you may not agree with that because you're wrong and they might be right? Because sometimes what happens is we assume, we take this position of judge where it's like, well, I don't agree with that person and they're wrong and I'm right. But I felt like the Lord said, listen, Larry, watch your heart. Watch your heart. Yeah, David, I don't have my new apostolic reformation uh, ring yet, but one of these days. The Lord said, watch your heart, Larry, because you might not agree with somebody or something because you actually need what they're carrying. You might not agree because you need to be teachable, Larry. You might not agree because you're wrong and they're right. Listen, hear me. I'm going to say it one more time, and then I'm going to read the scripture. We cannot, we cannot afford to compromise on the core tenets of the faith. What are those? I'll tell you exactly what they are. The exclusivity of Jesus, the Messiah. In other words, there's no other way to father God. There's no other God. There's no other religion. There's no other way. There's no philosophy. There's no other way to heaven. There's no other way to redemption. There is no other way to right standing with a holy God except through the work, the blood, the atonement, the cross, the sin-breaking power of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He is exclusive. I know that's highly offensive. I know that's highly confrontational. I know that when we exalt the name of Jesus, listen, it's one thing to say God. It's one thing to use generic God spiritual language. People can do that. There are people who've got churches of thousands and tens of thousands or religious groups and cults, and they will do everything they can to get on the same page with you using their language of, oh, God, or God bless you, or God, God, God. Yeah, it's one thing talk about God or the language of God, everything shifts when you speak of Jesus. And I'm not just talking about just talking about Jesus as Jesus, as the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through and by his work, period. If that is not included in the gospel presentation that somebody is presenting, if that language. I you can use it however. It's not the words that save you. It's not the words that it's not the prayer that saves you. But I believe it's the heart. But if you if the gospel is not communicated appropriately and clearly, if the gospel you're getting is some nonsensical self-actualization saying, "Well, you know what? Do you don't you don't want to live a crummy life anymore? You don't want to live a life without purpose and meaning?" Accept Jesus, and and God will accept you. And man, you're going to go from mediocre to honky-dory. You're going to go from a life where you had no meaning and purpose to now where your dreams will come true, and you're going to become the best you possible. That is false. 
if somebody, you know, and I'm not going to go around saying that the people who use some of that language are false teachers and false prophets. I pray to God that even if they use that language, that they still have some of the fundamentals and the core tenets of the gospel in their presentation. If they don't, though, that is dangerous. That is demonic. That is something we need to run away from. Okay. I will absolutely confront that without any question, without any problem. But I'm saying we need to be united on what are the core essentials, the non-negotiables of the faith. The gospel is one. Okay. Everything associated with the exclusivity of Jesus. That's one. There is no universalism. There is no ultimate reconciliation. It's a nice idea. It's, it sounds pleasant that one day everybody's going to make it. The reality is this. The soul that sins shall die. Okay? And yet we also read in the scriptures that Peter says the heart of God is for all to come to repentance. But those who don't are eternally separated from God. There is a place called hell. And that is not politically correct, but it is 100% true. So these are the things we need to talk about. And I do encourage you. I want to encourage you 100%. Jack Hibbs um, has an amazing two-part series that he did, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. Look up Jack Hibbs on Facebook, an amazing expository preacher. I love the Calvary Chapel movement because it was birthed in the fire of revival. Calvary Chapel was birthed out of this synergy of the charismatic, uh, the charismatic movement and the Jesus people movement. But anyway... It's important for us to be united on the non-negotiable, listen, the non-negotiables, the essentials of the faith. Jesus, one God, the infallibility of scripture. We don't get to reconstruct the Bible based on where culture and society is going. If anything, culture and society should be judged and evaluated by what the Bible says. And if culture and society are going in a direction that is in disharmony and disagreement with the scriptures, then guess what? Culture and society are wrong. God's not wrong. Culture is. And the reality is we need to be a prophetic voice in the midst of culture, declaring and preparing the way of the Lord. So. So many things that people stumble over, they're not essential. Gifts of the Spirit, powerful. We need to talk about them. I believe more and more, by the grace of God, people are accepting of the gifts of the Spirit. But we can have intelligent discussion, family debate, bold debate, heated debate upon these certain issues. We can have debate over revival manifestations. Should people fall down when they get prayed for, shake and, and, and cry and laugh and all that? I believe absolutely if God's going to touch somebody, I'm amazed they don't explode. I think it was John Arnett who said that that's the real miracle that somebody doesn't blow up. Um, so, yeah, let's have honest, intelligent debate and discussion about those things. Let's not hide it in some corner somewhere. Let's be brothers and sisters who can actually put on our you know, big person pants and go into the public forum of Christianity and love one another and talk about these things and grow as individuals as we talk through and, yes, even debate and disagree over these items, okay? But at the end of the day, here's the deal. The devil is sitting laughing as we rip each other apart, as the body of Christ, as those who claim Jesus is Christ, as those who are unified and in agreement on probably like 90% of the essentials. Nine, I mean 90% of everything. For the most part, we are in agreement over those things. The devil, I am convinced, he sits and he laughs at our lack of influence on culture and society because we are arguing over somebody who clucked like a chicken or barked like a dog one time in a revival meeting. We're arguing over this, that, and the other petty things. Sadly, we're arguing over statements that were repented of and repudiated 10, 15, 20 years ago that are under the blood of Jesus, as opposed to saying, you know what, we don't agree on this. Let's move forward and let's walk hand in hand over what we do agree on. And that is everything I've just mentioned concerning Jesus, concerning the Bible, and concerning the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we would be a light, we'd be salt and light. You know, because Jesus did say you're called to be the light of the church and the salt of Christianity. No, he didn't say that. He said you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. The earth, the planet, culture should look different because you and I show up. 
not just you and I, but the entire body of Christ. Imagine if we were all on the same page, showing up onto the scene of cultural conversation, showing up onto the scenes, declaring the word of the Lord, declaring what does God say about this, declaring God's strategies and God's solutions. Imagine if the entire ecclesia, the ecclesia, the church decided, you know what, let's gather around the 90% we do agree on and let's advance. I actually believe we would see seismic societal change. Okay, listen, I do believe there's going to be darkness. I believe there's going to be darkness and deep darkness. We see it on the earth right now. But I also believe we will see the advancement of the kingdom of God. I do believe when Jesus returns, he is looking for nations. He's looking for souls, 100%, but he's also looking. Would, would it be that we would present some nations to King Jesus when he does return? Let me read this scripture and then we're done. John 17, verse 20. This is what Jesus says. They call this his high priestly prayer. And this is relevant to me. It's relevant to you today. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, which was his immediate context, the people that he had been talking to and addressing, his disciples. I do not ask for these only, but also for those, you, you and I are the those, those who will believe in me through their word. We believe in Jesus ultimately because of the price the disciples, the early disciples, the early church paid. And obviously their words, their testimony concerning Jesus. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That what? What was Jesus praying concerning his people? Verse 21, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. I love this. So that the world may believe that you've sent me. My goodness. That is shocking to me. That is shocking that our unity and our oneness operating together, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters in Jesus, it shocks me to think that the world looks at the church and based on what we manifest concerning our unity and our oneness and our togetherness and our being on the same page, it shocks me to think that what the world thinks about God depends in part on our unity. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that they may be, that they, you and I, may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Finishing up verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. Thomas, thank, I'm just responding to some comments. Thank you. That, that really ministers to me. I'm making a lot of sense. I hope so. I hope this brings clarity because I'm going to pray in just a minute. And I want to pray for a spirit of unity. I actually believe that as we come into a place of unity, as they were in that upper room, the church will become a global upper room. Praise God for Corey Russell prophesying that language, that the church would be a global upper room. I feel it even coming now, just praying and prophesying. The church would be an upper room that becomes a womb that births souls, that births nations, that births transformation, that the church would become an upper room that is a womb that gives birth to the souls of man and the souls of nation. Verse 23 of John 17, I and them, this is the vision that Jesus presents. I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you guys for watching. And you know, I mean, it says there's 66 people, you know, 66. At one point we had a hundred people uh, watching the live broadcast. Let me know if you're watching right now. I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to be able to pray for everybody by name, but I want to include you in this prayer because I want us to be as one, okay, as one. You know, if you've ever been to one of Lance Walnow's events, that is one of the things. I can't even give the descriptive he get, gives about that, but he always likes to end with that declaration, as one. But you know what? That language comes from Jesus. I know it was in the movie Gladiator, but it also comes from Jesus. Um, so, Father, we thank you. <laughs> Father, we thank you that. First of all, we just bless. I bless Pastor Benny Hinn and his family. Father, I bless him for the father 
He is, he is, and he is becoming more and more to a generation. Father, I thank you for the miracles. I thank you for the souls. But Lord, I thank you that above all, he's a friend of God. Would you touch him and continue to take him deeper? God, expose him to the depths of your heart. He's on a journey right now. Father, he's a man who's walking with you, God. And I thank you for everything he has to impart to this next generation. And I thank you in Jesus' name. We may not all agree on everything, but help us to learn to celebrate one another, to celebrate what we do agree with and to call out what we don't agree with. But Father, help us not to go around demonizing one another. That doesn't help. All it does is just make the devil happy that we are in a place of division. But Lord, right now, I just declare that when we look at differences between one another, we don't see divisions that separate. We see distinctives, Father, that we can celebrate. And Lord, if we are believing incorrect and wrong things, expose it. Confront us. Yeah, we, 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 we should be mature enough to pray and talk that way. But Lord, we cannot, we cannot fall into this petty nonsense of being heresy hunters and going around and just trying to find everybody who's doing this, that, and the other wrong, God. I thank you right now for every sin under the, God, every sin and mistake under the, uh, that of the past that is under the blood of Jesus. We thank you for that, God. And Lord, we do not want to be like the devil going around and digging through stuff that is under the blood. We don't. We don't want to model the devil. And Lord, I end this, this time we've had together by praying what Jesus prayed. Lord, that we would be one as you, Jesus, and the Father are one. God, show us, God, seriously, show us how to discuss things with one another. God, show us how to debate with one another. Show us how to disagree respectively, uh, respectably, but boldly. God, you're not calling us to sweep disagreement under a rug somewhere. Because sometimes people teach that, and that's that that's get scary. Where it's like, oh, don't agree, don't disagree with anybody. No, no, no. Father, you want us to appropriately have conversation and disagreement. God, show us how to do it with honor. Show us how to do it with boldness. God, show us how to do it the right way. And Lord, above all, show us how to be one. Gathering around the essentials and the absolute non-negotiables, Lord. Because we know right now the devil is trying to turn Christianity. He's trying to turn the faith upside down, ultimately, so he can extract a prophetic voice from culture. He doesn't want us to be relevant. The enemy doesn't want us to be relevant, Father, but I thank you that we increase our relevance when we operate as one and we speak boldly into all the stuff that's going on right now. We speak boldly and have a prophetic voice on matters pertaining to the cultural conversation of the day and of the hour in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me on The Prophetic Life today on the Facebook Live or the podcast. A few exciting things that are coming up. Oh, my goodness. My brain literally just went blank. If you live in Europe, if you live in Scotland, I'm not sure how many of you. Two exciting events I do want to let you know about for February. Actually, three. Can I tell you just three very quick things is looking at my calendar. But in February, there are three powerful prophetic events coming up. Let me know right now if you will be able to come to any of them. Um, first of all, Friday, Friday, February 7th, will be the Prophetic Summit in Middleton, Ohio. Barbara Yoder, Chuck Pierce, um, hosted by Tim Sheets. It's going to be a powerful time. I will be there. I am looking forward to it. So grateful for the opportunity just to share maybe five, ten minutes, but I'm going to release this word that the Lord is putting in me, and I believe he's given clarity concerning the emergence of this Elijah collective meant to speak up and show up on the main stage of cultural conversation. So that is uh, Friday, February 7th in Middleton, Ohio. You can go to Oasis Church, Oasis Wired. Pastor, it's uh, Pastor Tim Sheets up in Ohio, author of Angel Armies. And then I believe it's February 14th and 15th. In Glasgow, Scotland, I will be speaking at the Start the Year Right conference with the wonderful, the amazing prophet Emma Stark. She's become one of my favorite people. She's one of our Destiny Image authors. I'm looking forward, actually, soon to doing a Facebook Live with her. We've got some exciting Facebook Lives coming up. But um, anyway, that will be uh, 
February 14th and 15th in Glasgow, Scotland. If you go to Prophetic Scots, I forget the website, but it's Prophetic Scots online. All the information will be there. And then finally, uh, February is a big month, folks. Finally, we've got the Spiritual Warfare Conference, the Glory Warfare Conference in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And that'll be February 20th through the 22nd. That is going to be a wonderful explosion of Holy Spirit, the prophetic. We're going to have, it's hosted by myself and the wonderful Becca Greenwood. But we're going to have Cindy Jacobs, Barbara Yoder, Will, uh, Will, Will Hart. Not Will Hart at this one, Will Ford, Jenny Weaver doing the worship, Kevin Zaydai. Trisha Roselli, so grateful for Trisha and her wonderful husband, Peter, um, not only allowing us to use their amazing church up there, but they're just awesome apostolic leaders in the Northeast region. Uh, Kevin Zadai, Anna Warner, it is going to be an amazing time. I believe it's almost completely full. So I encourage you to go to Christian Harvest, I-N-T-L, it's Becca Greenwood's web, website, and you can register there. Um, and yeah. That's everything that's coming up. I can tell you that is a very busy and exciting February. I see people saying, looking forward to seeing you in New Jersey. That's going to be an explosive conference. So look forward to seeing all of you guys soon. Thank you for joining me on this episode of The Prophetic Life. Talk to you soon.